13 to 23. <clears throat> he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Good morning, church. It's lovely to be here this morning and lovely to look at a, a pretty amazing passage. I actually find, uh, sometimes find Paul's writing in Ephesians and Colossians a bit overwhelming with their theological density and I guess the hugeness of the vision that he puts before us. And so hopefully, uh, with God's help, we'll understand this and really marvel at uh, the greatness of Jesus and who he is. So let's uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to give uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to worship and enjoy you this morning. Please uh, expand our minds, uh, lift up our eyes uh, to behold Jesus with an ever greater depth and wonder, uh, for you are truly worthy of our attention, of our worship, and of our study. So help us this morning to study and marvel at you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, would you like an upgrade with your faith? Perhaps you're struggling a little bit in the Christian walk, uh, godliness, commitment. Uh, would you like an upgrade with your faith? Uh, we do like a good upgrade these days. You buy a laptop and you can get 250 gig laptop or upgrade it to 500. You look at a gym membership and you can upgrade to have unlimited spin classes. You go to insurance uh, for your car, would you like fire and theft with that? What about windshield cover for when you're on the road? You go to a hotel and you think, oh, I wouldn't mind upgrading to have uh, city views. Uh, and if you have any streaming services or subscription services, I guarantee there's that one upgrade you could have that would make your viewing or enjoyment of that product just a little bit better. We like a good upgrade. So would you like and upgrade with your faith. Today's passage says, although you might want one, you don't need one. You already have it all. You already have what you need. It doesn't get any better than what we have. But we do look for uh, funny little upgrades in our life and in our Christian faith. Um, judging by this letter, uh, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, it seems that the church at Colossae was looking for something a little bit more, or at least being tempted by other people who came in and said, if you just add this, if you just add angels, experience with angels, if you just added visions, then you would really reach a whole new level of Christian faith. You would upgrade uh, your faith. And I think I even have a tendency to do this. I'm sure we all do. Here's an example from, from my life. I decided to make it a habit that on occasions I would ask people if they've ever uh, seen or been helped by an angel. Uh, I, I did this because a political commentator that I follow will often ask if people have seen ghosts, and so he's collected all these ghost stories. And I thought, well, angels are real. Uh, God hasn't stopped working through them, so there must be stories out there of people being helped by angels. And so every now and then I'll ask uh, if people have had that experience, and I've had some pretty amazing stories uh, shared with me about how people have been helped in uh, 
situations where they were dying or when they didn't know Jesus before. Uh, but here was the problem. Uh, I started thinking, wouldn't it be cool if an angel came into my life really miraculously, you know, touched by an angel? What a testimony I would have, uh, a story of how God engaged so personally with me. It would be like a really good upgrade to my faith and my witness if I had one of those amazing stories. But it wouldn't. It actually wouldn't. I don't need an upgrade. And that is what Colossians 1 shows me and shows us today. We cannot upgrade from Jesus. Instead, our faith in Jesus is meant to expand and grow, to comprehend more and more the greatness and goodness of Jesus as Lord. The greatness of uh, Jesus uh, that we believe in, the view we have of Jesus, it needs to be big. It needs to be big enough to carry us through the rest of the book. Uh, It needs to be big enough to carry us through life, through suffering, through uh, obedience. We need a big view of Jesus and who he is. And the deeper we understand Jesus, uh, the more we are going to grow. And so our passage uh, puts forward this amazing Jesus and how he is going to help. And I want you to see this is really the purpose of, Jesus, of the passage because uh, we're actually, as we come to verse 15, we're actually in the second half of a very long sentence in the Greek. So this sentence began, believe it or not, in verse 9, where Paul says, I want you to have a deeper understanding. And that sentence has kept on going. Paul got carried away. He uh, ran out of breath eventually, but we're halfway through a uh, sentence. This is the second half that started in verse 9. So this deeper understanding that Paul prays for, he then kind of gives us, or he gives us a deeper, more full view of Jesus that is emphasized for, for us in verses 15 to 23. And just notice the way, uh, just in passing, the way Jesus speaks, um, which is spoken of. He's, being, he's um, described as being above and totally supreme. So it says Jesus is the first born of all creation. All things were created by him. He is before all things. He's the firstborn from the dead that he might be preeminent in everything. All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him and he will reconcile all things to himself. Jesus is supreme in all areas of life and over all things. So we're going to break this down and think a bit more deeply about Jesus And just for those who are note takers, first we're going to see that Jesus is supreme over creation. He's the supreme creator. And then second, we're going to see that uh, Jesus is the supreme reconciler. And then we're going to see how we should respond to this Jesus. So first, Jesus is the supreme creator of all things. This is verses 15 to 17 of chapter 1 in Colossians. So Paul starts with a description of Jesus, then he explains why this is true of him. So he says in verse 15, this is a description of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Uh, While Jesus was on earth, he said of himself, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, has seen God. Uh, You and I, we're all made in the image of God, and yet uh, if you look at me, Uh, You don't see God. You might see a bit of what God is like, hopefully, after a coffee, but Jesus shows us fully the invisible God. He is the image of God. He's called the uh, firstborn of creation. Uh, Some take this to mean that Jesus was a created being, a created thing. That is uh, what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Uh, But I think that misunderstands a few things, both how the word firstborn is used and also the context of our passage this morning. So firstborn can be uh, linear in terms of time. So the first son is born, he's the oldest, second son, third son, fourth son. That's linear on on a time scale. But it can also be according to rank. So it's hierarchy, the first, the most important, the second, uh, the third. And so uh, Psalm uh, 89 verse 27 speaks about it in terms of rank and order. Uh, When it speaks of Jesus, the Messiah, it says, I will make him the firstborn, the greatest of the kings of the earth. So it's not about a time, but it's about position. He isn't the firstborn king, but he is the greatest, the highest king born. 
Another example for you is in Exodus 22. Uh, uh, Israel is called uh, the firstborn. They aren't the first nation. Israel isn't the first nation that came into existence. But before God, they are the first in importance. They're the most important nation to God in Exodus 4.22. Uh, and as we go on to see why Jesus can be called the firstborn in creation, we see that uh, it explains that he isn't a created thing. He's in a whole different category, the category of God. And so verse 16 says, For by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Paul wants us to know that everything, absolutely everything, was created by Jesus. He is outside this created order. He's not in the category of created things. He is the eternal God who creates. And what is said about Jesus, this Jesus, is extraordinary. First, it says he created everything. It's estimated that there's five million different species of insects. And he thought of them. He designed them, he formed them, he placed them in their necessary habitats. It's estimated that there's 200 billion trillion stars, however many that is. And now Megan was doing a, a design course at uni and she had to draw, I think it was, and draw and design 80 different types of stars with different pointing and different styles. And, uh, and I think I could maybe do 50 at a stretch and they'd be not the most creative stars. Yet Jesus, he designed trillions, uh, billions, uh, billions of stars. Furthermore, he made billions of people with our individual faces and pers personalities, new snowflakes falling every day, all different leaves falling in autumn, none the same, different in shape and color and design. Jesus created everything. He is the origin of everything. But add to your thoughts of Jesus that everything was created not just by him, but for him. He is the purpose and goal of everything. What's the point of all things? It's Jesus. You and me, we are amazing creations of Jesus. Our noses detect millions of scents. Our brains are sometimes more active while we sleep than when we're awake. This is my favorite fact I learned as I was thinking about God's creation. We create one liter of saliva every single day. How's that? And God gave us individual identification codes on our fingers. God made it possible for a man and a woman to create a new life, bring into existence someone that was not there. We are an amazing creation, the greatest of all God's creations. And yet we, even we, were made for Jesus to show his greatness, to worship him, to use this created body, mind, and soul for our creator. Jesus is the purpose for everything. Add to this that Jesus sustains everything. Verse 17 says, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. If you wanted a rule book on how, to, how the universe was made and continues, uh, the answer I think is there's like 12 rules that have to keep going, but I'm not smart enough to comprehend them. My simple answer is Jesus. Jesus keeps it going. Jesus sustains everything. I'm not saying scientific understanding isn't wonderful and eye-opening, but there's something greater than that, which is Jesus. Without Jesus, day and night would cease. Spring, summer, autumn, and winter would end. Atoms would stop holding together. It would be over without Jesus. Jesus is the origin, the purpose, and the sustainer of everything. Jesus is the theory of everything. He is the supreme creator of all things. And that is why the gospel message about him must go into the whole world, because Jesus is supreme over this whole world. And that's why there's not one area of our lives that Jesus doesn't rule over, that he doesn't have a say. Our work and recreation, our screen time and gaming, our private and public lives, the environment, our online presence, Jesus is over all of it. Jesus is amazing. 
Sometimes you can maybe think of him as kind of a Middle Eastern uh, carpenter who walked around in sandals and got dusty feet, but he understands everything. He is great. He understands the internet. He understands quantum physics, molecular biology, statistics, psychology, morality, philosophy. He knows it all. He is the creator of all things, visible and invisible, ideas and material things. Jesus is the creator of all things. Isn't he amazing? Isn't he greater than you normally think of him? That's the first point. Jesus is the supreme creator of all things. A second, Jesus is the supreme reconciler of all things. Verses 18 to 22. Look there at verse 18, another description of Jesus. Uh, He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. That's quite a shift, isn't it? The church, the church, the head of the church. At the time of Paul's writing, the church he's writing to was just a small pe- a group of people. In the letter to Philemon, it's referred to as those gathered in Philemon's house. We might expect the sentence to read, Jesus is the head of the universe. But Paul doesn't say that. Say that. He says, Jesus is the head of this church that gathers in Philemon's house. house. And you do wonder, has uh, Paul changed subject off Jesus' greatness? Uh, Well, no, he hasn't, because the church is the beginning. It is the beginning of new things, new created things. We are the beginning of Jesus restoring all creation. You see, the way forward, not just the beginning of created things, that's Jesus, but the way forward is with Jesus, You don't start with him and move on. No, Jesus is the one who's able to fix the whole world and fix us. Uh, Because we all recognize that this created world is broken. Perhaps as I was describing creation, you thought, if I designed a system as messed up as the world, I'd be fired from my job. Uh, There's natural disasters and famine and extinction and brutal violence and corporate greed and death. Uh, And that's true. Uh, This is a world that's horribly marred and broken by sin. And Jesus is going to be supreme over fixing that problem and beginning again. We see why he is going to do this in verse 16. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So Jesus knows the horror of sin and death, But he is the one, the first one, who rose over that, coming to newness of life, to live forever, never to die again, never to decay. Jesus is the first of many to die and rise to new, perfect life. You see why we stay with Jesus? He's the beginning of new things and new life. And because he died and rose, that means eventually everything will be reconciled to him. Uh, reconciled is, uh, reconciling is what happens between two parties who are opposed to one another. Uh, in this case, uh, there's God on one side and his creation on the other, and we're at odds with him. Uh, sin has made a relationship between us and God impossible. And so God comes to make peace. God comes to reconcile the world to himself. Look at verse 19. For in Jesus... All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Uh, This is one of the most astounding claims of Christianity, I think, that Jesus' death and resurrection is going to affect the whole cosmos. Uh, That all the disharmony and chaos and disorder in this universe will be removed and reordered through Jesus. Uh, We're not told exactly how at this point. We're told later that Jesus uh, will triumph over all the evil forces that influence this world, the evil forces that push and lay behind greed or anger or violence. All of those were triumphed over at the cross. And notice that it is uh, through the blood, that is through the sacrifice of Jesus, 
that this sin and wrongdoing is overcome and remade. And this uh, sacrifice was great enough to pay for sin because Jesus was God. So all the fullness of God was in him, in Jesus, in a man, and so he came and made peace, representing God and man. So through Jesus' death, the world will return to peace with God, and we will return to peace with God and to rule properly over new creation. All things are going to be made new through Jesus. He's supreme over this reconciliation. He's the origin of it. It begins with him and his resurrection, and it's going to happen through him as both God and man. So this reconciliation gets very personal next. It gets very personal in verse 21. It says, and you, and you. So far, it's been all he, 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 Jesus, 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 but now you and me. And what Paul has to say about you and me is quite hard to hear at first, verse 21. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Uh, That's humanity's state. Uh, We're included in creation's separation from God, hostility seen in our mind and actions. I notice that Paul highlights the mind here. We have a wrong understanding that leads to wrong actions. Often our minds can be like a greenhouse that cultivates all these evil thoughts before they're ever acted upon. And our minds uh, and, uh, and our minds and our actions, uh, they don't naturally run in line with God and his mind and his actions. And so our minds need to be changed with an understanding of Jesus with an understanding of who he is. And that's what Paul has been trying to do, fix our minds and our understanding. But verse 22 says, but now Jesus has reconciled us in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus' death reconciles us by making us perfect and holy and blameless forgiving our sins and giving us the righteousness of Jesus. That's the disconnect between us and God. The separation, the hostility is our sin towards God. This is God qualifying us. You remember from last week, God qualifies us to share in his kingdom. He makes us holy and blameless through the death of Jesus, making peace by his blood. See, Jesus is the supreme reconciler of all things and his reconciliation begins with you and it begins with us the church that he is the head of and one day it will be seen throughout all creation jesus is the supreme reconciler of all things and for you personally it doesn't matter the offense that you have caused him in your mind or in your actions It doesn't matter how long you've been away from God. It doesn't matter how much effort you have put in to making peace with God. It is Jesus' death that makes peace between you and God and enables you to walk into his presence and know his joy and love, to be in a relationship with the one who can make you new. And so we see in our last point in verse 23 that we need to continue in Jesus and continue in faith. There's no upgrade to Jesus, to the Jesus that we have seen this morning. That's what we see here in verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Have faith in Jesus, Paul says. Why would you do anything else? faith that Jesus died for you and takes away sin. This is, of course, the first step you must take in the Christian walk, but it's the continued steps going into Jesus, continuing in the faith. You must continue believing the gospel. There's no other way to be saved and to grow as a Christian. And notice that it's to continue in the faith, not your faith. 
the faith. The emphasis is on the object of your faith or what you believe, not on the strength or ups and downs of how you feel or how strong your commitment to God feels. The faith is what we're holding on to. And it's described in uh, three ways. First, it's the, the gospel that they heard. Uh, that's the one they heard from Epaphras, Epaphra, uh, which is described as the gospel of truth, this gospel. Second, it's called the gospel, uh, the faith that is being proclaimed in all creation. By this, I think it means that there's, there's one universal gospel by which everyone and everything will be reconciled. Now is the Uh, When this was written, it was the gospel that was saving people. Today, it is the gospel that is saving people. 10,000 years from now, it'll be this universal gospel that must be proclaimed throughout all creation. It is this gospel that saves people. And then thirdly, it's uh, described as the gospel of faith, which Paul was a minister of. Paul is what's called, uh, so it's an apostolic gospel, meaning that Jesus has appointed certain men to preach the gospel, to write God's word for us. He authenticated them with gifts of power, uh, with miracles to show that their words were true and should be listened to above all else. And so uh, Paul says, listen to their gospel, uh, not another gospel, not something else you hear. Listen to the gospel that was passed down to Jesus' disciples and apostles and authenticated by their miracles. And Paul says, of this faith, of this gospel, continue. Steadfast, stable, not shifting. Never move on from Jesus, the creator and reconciler of all things. Why would me, would we? What more do we need? What more can we ask for than the presence of the Lord Jesus in our life? to change and help us? Who but Jesus has the power to save and change? Who can make us new? Who can make peace between us and God? Who can welcome us into God's kingdom? And no one but Jesus. So we continue in him. Let us be a church that will not budge an inch on the gospel and its power. Let us not be embarrassed by the blood of the cross by which the whole world will be reconciled to God. Let us not shy away from our creator Jesus, but acknowledge him in every area of our life. We worship and believe in a wonderful Jesus. Now, I'm not much of an explorer myself. Um, I'm happy at home, not traveling, but I know that many of you uh, love to travel, and there's so many places in the world that you could go to and explore that you haven't been, even the places you might have been, you know there's more that you like to see, you like to go back there, and the world is just such a big and amazing place that you would never, ever get sick of, dis- of uh, discovering it, even with 100 lifetimes. There'd be places, an unlimited budget, there'd be places for you to explore. And as we look at Jesus, I think that's the attitude we want to have towards him that we could have unlimited lifetimes discovering how wonderful and amazing Jesus is, how he wants to help us and work in, be at work in every single area of his life, how his uh, control and power and sustaining works throughout all creation. You can think of all the things that he's going to do in the future by his great power. Our job is to go deeper, to understand more fully how amazing the Lord Jesus is so that we will honor him, so that we bring praise to him. And that rest of Colossians helps us to put this wonderful Jesus at the very center of our life. It gets more practical if you jump ahead to chapter three, it'll talk about setting our minds and our hearts on the Lord Jesus, where our life is. It'll go further, and you'll see when it talks about husbands and wives, it'll talk about behaving in a way that's fitting of the Lord. Or it'll talk about uh, if you're a boss, Uh, Think of Jesus and the type of master that he is to you. If you're um, a child, it will say, hey, how you relate to your heavenly father, how you relate to the Lord should affect the way you relate to your parents. And so throughout your life, uh, Colossians is going to take this wonderful Jesus and place him at the very center of of our lives so that we continue in him, continue holding on to him, continue thinking of him, continue being amazed by Jesus. And so I look forward to that in a few weeks. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the glorious Lord Jesus that you have shown us this morning. Please uh, make Jesus God and as man, just help us to be amazed and full of wonder and praise towards him. Help us to value him more highly than we do now, to have bigger thoughts than we have ever had of Jesus before. Our Lord Jesus, you are enough. We need not add anything to you. So help us to remain steadfast in you, I pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.